Hello, Paul, and uh, oh. welcome to another truth, truth proof live stream tonight. Uh, great night tonight. I'm really excited. What about you, Paul? Great stuff. Yeah, I've been uh, looking forward to showing people a little bit of what we've been doing regarding uh, the documentary. I think it's been a long time coming. We've been, as as everybody in chat knows, and we've been sort of banging on about it for a long, I don't know, three years. So you're not going to get three years of it tonight, people, but you're going to get a little taste of it, and hopefully what you what you taste you'll like. But before that, because I think we're going to come on with about 8 o'clock, are we, Les? Yeah, the scheduling we've got is uh, uh, 8 o'clock, as you say, and uh, I know, I know, going by my uh, crib sheet here, Paul, that we've got a few accounts and sightings to go through before then. Yeah, yeah. So, we're, we're hope. Hope everybody who's uh, on the stream tonight can wait till we actually get to stream the 15-minute sizzle video because I think that's what they call it in the in the industry, sizzle video, and uh, and that'll be as I say at eight o'clock. And uh, got to welcome everybody onto the chat tonight. Everybody who's come on for the to the stream maybe for the first time, and uh, welcome. And I can see lots and lots of you on in the chat tonight. So we'll just go. I'll let Paul go through a few other names. Yeah, well, it's, it's great. I mean. Obviously, thanks for the support, guys. We really, really appreciate it. I can see Town and Country, Nick's Exploration, Nilsie Brown, Steve 071, Jane Louise Bowery. Hi, Jane. Good to see you, Tino. Every, do you know a lot of these people are, are friends? It's, it's absolutely brilliant. They've be, become friends due to the nature of what we're doing. Nigel Logan, Ralph Winter, Sky was doing moderating, as, as you know. Lisa also makes me laugh. Disabled Welshman, it shouldn't do, <laughs> but it does. Matt Rhodes, Paul Adley, Lee Roscoe. Uh, Sherwood Dowser, you know, Fab Simon Riley, thank you. And and I see Mick Parkin. Uh, great stuff. Great to see you, Mick. And we've just gone like a little bit of a racing commentary there. Just got through a few names. There's going to be people out of Limits Magazine, Chris Evers, that, that we've missed. But everybody's welcome. It's We just try to treat everybody the same. There's no egos within Truth Proof, or, or at least I hope there isn't. And yeah, if you like big cats, We'll be talking a little bit about the big cat. We'll call it the phenomena. I don't necessarily subscribe to the fact that they, they're something mystical, but they're clearly in this country. And, you know, I've been, I've been looking at a few reports that we've had over the years to, to Truth Proof websites and to emails. And I think, I think they're worth talking about because, not least, Les, because... Let's assume that a lot of these cats are, are a product of the 1976 Wildlife Act when people had to have licenses to keep the big cats. So yeah. so people, private collections, I don't know, they let them go. People who'd had cats that were just too big and outgrown, you know, everything, everybody knows it, just be buying a puppy. Once it stops being a puppy, some people just don't find attractiveness of owning one. I've let them go. I, I, you know, there's lots and lots of sort of reasons why these cats are here. But I think 1976 Wildlife Act is probably the main reason. But what I find interesting, Les, is the fact that the places that the cats seem to frequent are the places where there's a lot of unexplained phenomena. Are they more clever than us? They've sought out the places that are so remote. It's, you know, that, that element to it uh, I, I quite like. But uh, I know we've talked about it this, this coming week. We've been on about cats. So anybody that's got questions, it does not have to be big cat related people. Please put them in capital letters. Uh, fire your questions at Alison and, and Sky, and obviously they'll make their way to Les. And I do apologise if we don't get through them all. And uh, yeah, just... Yeah, sure, yeah. Les. Yeah, and uh, just echo what Paul says. Thank you to everybody for coming on uh, the chat tonight. And just for any newcomers that may be on, Paul... Uh, we do have the web page on the site, but just uh, tell anybody who's uh, not familiar with you what they can do when they get to the web page as regards reporting. Yeah, there's the truthproof.uk website. So we've got, we haven't got hundreds and hundreds, but we've got close to a few hundred reports on there, all unique to that website. So email me, the, the reports will get read by myself or Don Lodge, your manager's site. And uh, Don's a sort of, He's got a, a good eye for, for for a decent report, and I know that uh, if he puts it on uh, or we discuss it, it it's going to be interesting. The books are for sale on the website, the paperbacks, the 
obviously the Kindles are on Amazon and you can also buy the paperbacks on eBay. And if you're new to Truth Proof and you enjoy it, please like and subscribe. You know, we really would appreciate the support. And uh, yeah, let's just jump in unless you've got hotels to add, Les. No, that's it. We'll uh, kick off. Uh, I'm really excited for later on. I'm sure everybody else is <laughs> on the chat as well. I, I can't contain my excitement. And uh, and thank you again, Sky, for coming on and helping us tonight. So, what have I got? Uh, strange uh, cat sight, big cat sightings in, in the UK. So, what I'd like to go to, Paul, is that uh, the uh, there's a mixture of like cats uh, and uh, dogs and a mix of both and and pumas and and whatever leopards or what have you uh so let, we'll go through some of these say uh, what's coming through to you we'll start off with the the rudston monolith panther which seems a good one to start with yeah it's, it's probably five years ago uh if my memory serves me right i ain't got exact date in front of me but once again the rudston monolith a place with a mystical element and it's in a village so it's not isolated. It's not in the middle of nowhere, even though Rudston's just a small village. And there's not a lot to the story. Some people came to look at the monolith in the night. And a lot of people do. It's lit up the churchyard. Obviously, there's some big mature trees in it. Yeah. And uh, as they're looking at the monolith and they have a little wander round, they look up into one at trees. And now we're not going to say a black panther, or I'm not, because it's dark. You know, you're not going to know whether it were dark brown, beige. There's a big cat yeah. sat in a tree on one of the big, big boughs. Glowing eyes that they see. And uh, I don't, I'm not saying self-illuminating, but they see glowing eyes. It's glowering at them. Even hisses at them. So quite a frightening experience. And it's it's Rudston. You know, there's so many cat sightings come out of this little village. You know, and, and, and UFO sightings. I mean, we've even got... I've even got a report from a farm in Rudston where a couple could see some lights in the distance. And this is a farm just going out of Rudston, a Springdale farm. I don't know if it's been renamed now, but that's that's what it was. And they're watching these lights, and whatever it is, comes towards the window and then just goes straight up. Something mechanical. I don't yeah. think it were an helicopter. I don't think it were an aircraft. They're not going to get that close to windows. And once again, yeah. Rudston, and the, that is the place where I was uh, contacted by a farmer and taken to look at a crop circle, providing and I didn't uh, tell anybody where it was. Uh, yeah, and what what year was that, Paul? Did the did, did, did lights come over? Uh, the, the lights came over, I would have think it would be 2014, 2015. It, whatever yeah. it, were, it was, it was in the distance and came very quick. And I don't mean yeah. up to the window, but up and, and gone straight up vertically. Big lit yeah. up object. I don't think I know, an helicopter is going to do that. No, I know we, uh, we've got a few sightings to go through tonight as regards big cats and and what have you. But uh, I'll just say, I'll just ask from the outset is there any like cluster time zones, like years? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so yeah, if you yeah, could just is. tell us about the, although, the years. Although social media sort of throws the cat sightings up, particularly around Bempton, but yeah, but yeah. Bear, I, I'm, I'm not being biased here, people, but I should imagine if you lived in Scarborough and you're on social media pages there, somebody's going to tell me that they're showing up there because I know that people see cats at Scalby Mills. Incidentally, one of our strange uh, incidents, one of our witnesses had his experience at Scalby Mills. Once again, but it weren't a big cat. And what, what, what I'm saying is that is there any years? 1994, Les. 1994 ah. seems prolific for cat sightings. Yeah. And uh, and does not and does 1994 overlap with some like, increased UFO activity? No, or no. Like that? Good question. No. Good question. Uh, it doesn't seem to. No. Uh, the only the only correlation I can get is that a lot of the places which I touched on earlier that the scene are, are where a lot of other unexplained phenomena are seen. And I don't particularly want people to think I'm leaning on the idea that the cats are somehow some kind of mystical beasts. But it is fascinating that they've sought out these these areas of strangeness because that's essentially what this, they appear to have done. And that's not me forming that opinion. That's, that's where it's leading me. That's where the research points. You know, with, with Wolfland's. The, the, the work we've done in Wolflands and the witnesses, 
what have you got in the forests of North Yorkshire? You've got allegedly breeding pairs, of two breeding pairs, one in Howard Dale, of big cats. And now does Paul know this? Because people have told us. Does, but does it mean it's gospel and set in stone? No, it doesn't. But uh, I have no reason to believe they're not there. Yeah, I mean, you say it's like uh, the two breeding pairs are corro corroborated by the locals, as it were. Yes, that's correct. Uh, yeah. How, uh, let's have a look, how can I phrase this? You've got organisations what look after animal welfare, like uh, RSPCA and uh, things like that. Now, do they get involved in reports of this kind of, of any sort? Well, they might do, uh, and but I don't hear about it. And uh, that don't mean what people will be saying, well, why should you hear about it, Paul? But I'm finding out about the cat sightings from the people who've seen them. So uh, yeah. that's not to say that there, in, there aren't witnesses who've never spoke to me and then gone to the RSPCA or gone to, I don't know, for I, I want of a better word, cat protection, which wouldn't be the dealing with big cats, but what I'm saying is I don't see any evidence that uh, animal welfare people, the, the RSPCA and groups like that, have got any connections to the big cats. I, I would imagine that they don't even want to acknowledge that they're here. It's probably too much like hard work, and I, you know, and I'm, if that sounds tough on them, because I think they do a great job sort of providing homes and protecting domestic cats but this is this is too much like hard work who's going to go into forests yeah. and it's proper deep yeah research that needs doing to, to to identify that they're actually here and then another reason why they might not be interested is what are they doing wrong what are these cats doing you know th th when we were talking about it and the locals that we'd we that i'd spoken to and th they believe that do these cats are providing a service they're actually keeping down the deer population. They're keeping uh, rodents at bay. They're not harming anybody. And so it, I, I don't think that they're doing anything wrong either. You know, why would people authorities get involved? I think they know they're here. Another reason, yeah. Les, is if they got involved and acknowledged that they're here and somebody got hurt, it's everybody, it's a, it's, a, it's a blame and claim culture that we're living in. Yeah, but won't that won't that um, uh, man set work in reverse? Where if they don't acknowledge it, but and someone got hurt, there'd be outcry as well, wouldn't they? Well, Equal they would, outcry, they saying, would. "Well, why are you doing the uh, you know your due diligence and looking into these things?" Well, up until now, I, I don't know about you, and I don't know. I, there's probably people in chat and people who are going to watch this afterwards who've said, "I've seen them. I know it's a genuine big cat." show me some good pictures show me some good footage on a trail cam of these things but it's not, it's not there and you know the people that have i know that there's a somebody got a photograph in bempton and there's somebody got a photograph at bookton of one at bookton pond i've seen the one at bookton pond and i've been asked not to show it <laughs> and, and you know what i mean i've, I've got the i saw it tonight actually because i sent you a picture tonight and i saw the picture and i've been asked not to show the picture so uh, what well, and there and the reason behind that is what unwanted attention on on the God people. Knows. God knows. I, I don't know. I don't know. You'd probably be surprised if if I said who'd got the picture, and people would be surprised. Uh, but uh, yeah, so and and that doesn't surprise me. I mean, the local paper uh, a few years ago, because I'd set cameras up round the Buckton Pond, and for people that don't know, Buckton is about a mile from Speeton and a mile from Bempton, so it sits in the middle and there's a village pond. It's that shallow, it dries up in summer. But oh, once again, what I find fascinating about these cat sightings is that there's a concentration of sightings for a few weeks and then it's almost like they drop off the map. They don't exist. And you'd think if they were transient and moved to another area, then they'd be seen in another area, but they're not being. But over a, over a period of about three weeks back in, I don't know the year, I think it was 2017, because the, the, the Bridlington Echo did a little article on me because I'd been setting cameras up very early in the morning and I'd set some trail cams up. Uh, people had been seeing a black cat round the Buckton Pond, a big black cat. I never got it on camera. I tried. And uh, I spoke I spoke to all the witnesses. Well, I will not say all because some people might not come forward. But I, I spoke to quite a few people who claimed to have seen it. 
a lady who went to tend to a horse as had seen it. She thought it were a Labrador drinking outside at Pond and slowed her cat down. <laughs> Stop yourself, Bob. Yeah. Slowed her car down and, uh, and the cat stood up. So, yeah, you know, um, well, they're there. Just to, just to interject there, 2017, is that not a period when you saw an increase in uh, uh, animal um, mutilations? Yeah, yeah, it, it is, yeah, 2017. But were they responsible for the animal mutilations? I, I don't think so. Uh, all I spent from 2017 uh, all the way, all the way through to early 2019 on some fields at Bempton. As people know, I become like a broken record, guys, don't I? But at half four in the morning, half five, coming off at eight o'clock, looking for these animals that had been killed, and. The way they were being killed does not suggest that it were a big cat to me. You know, I were finding them sometimes well before daylight and their eyes are removed. We've gone through all this, Les, haven't we? Their ears are removed. Yeah. Front yeah. left leg. It's not It's not the kind of act, uh, actions or things that we would expect to see from a cat kill. Let's put it that way. And you can see it and you can see when other animals, when they've been left a few days, you can see when the other wildlife decide to descend upon the, the, the food source, the devastation and the carnage. But these are faces stripped to skin. It was a strange, it was a strange time, 2017 in particular. But at the same time, the cats were being seen. Uh, I got a report in from, uh, on my notes here, from Howard Dill, uh, oh, the Howard Dill Panther feet feeding sheep. Uh, yeah, well, well, I can relate to what it means, and you'll remember this, Les. When we were making Wolflands, and I think we ended up around Harwood Dale. Correct. Uh, and let me correct myself. We, we ended up at Langdale End. Langdale End. Langdale End, it, yeah. and we were doing a bit of filming, and uh, we, we created a little bit of suspicion, I would think, because it's a pretty remote area. And we'd set cameras up and we were filming running water of all things people not nothing too exciting just for cutaways for film and uh, this elderly farm female farmer came up to us and asked us what we were doing thought we looked a bit suspicious and i don't know whether it were a daughter that were with her or, or I, well i don't know but the, the elderly lady you know we told her what we were doing we told her what we were investigating and she kind of laughed she, she'd never heard anything like it and she lived in the heart of where we're looking don't mind saying that it takes nothing away from what, what we've filmed and the people we've spoken to so we asked her about the cats I think you asked her about the big cats Les and we'll assume it were the daughter she's loading bales into a flat back pickup yeah, well, we was a little bit hesitant in telling them what was doing, actually, weren't we? Because well, you it's are, not, because uh, it's not kind of thing you're going to talk to people about, is it? Yeah, but then again, you you, you like a, make an instant uh, assessment of people, don't you? And think, well, can they handle this when you when you tell them? Mm, can they handle it? And but, but, can they handle it? And they did, didn't they? So, yeah, carry on, Paul. Yeah, yeah so this this lady said that they'd got sheep at Harwood Dale, which would probably be a few miles away, another forest. Like we've said before, all these woodlands and forests are linked. They're just they're just separated by names. And she's tending to her sheep one day, and she's I may imagine she's in some kind of meadow because the, the, there's gorse on a bit of a banking. She said, and in close proximity to where she's working, she's kind of looking. It's a bright day, and she sees two feet in the in the gorse. And she looked at him, and then she, when she looks deeper, there's a black, big cat looking at her. No aggression, nothing. But it's there. It doesn't know it's been seen. Or we'll assume it doesn't know it's been seen. So she knew. And then what did they say, Les? I think they turned around and said that we know that, that from other locals that they're here. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. You know, so yeah. so there's, there's, no, there's no shortage of people. When I first started... I wouldn't say looking into the the big cats, but when the question were brought up, I mean, I know that I know for a fact that uh, one farmer said we don't want people like him up and around here, which is me, obviously. I don't know whether the, what they thought I were going to do. I don't know whether they thought I were going to break fences and leave gates open and and 
and do all manner of things and reveal to people the exact locations where these things are seen. And that's why I'm saying in those forests, there are two breeding pairs. And the, the people in the know, obviously, know exactly where they are and they want them left alone. And they think that they're doing a good job. They think, you know, I don't think they're having any problems uh, with, with uh, predation on sheep. Although, I can't say for certain because, excuse me, when I went up there, we, me and Chris Wright have wandered around those forests extensively. Uh, partly to do with wolflands, but partly because we're just like exploring area. And we've been in some remote areas and we've found a concentration of sheep carcasses in various states of, what should we say, of, of uh, predation from lots of bones in the forest you put a fence up to stop sheep getting out how are they getting in the forest and we found lots of bones in the forest i mean anybody who's been who's been here where i'm sat now in in bridlington will see i'm a drives my wife nuts all the sheep skulls i bring them back with me <laughs> i think it's like do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm like one of them them babies in a cot and i've got them on a mobile it's, it's nuts, but no, it's 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 interesting. There's there's when you're finding concentrations of large animal bones, and it's quite a large animal, a ewe and a ram, in deep in a forest. Well, we've got to have a reason why they're there, and you can't say oh it's poachers and they've sort of they, they've they've I don't know portioned up the meat and then taken it because there's lots of places a lot more accessible to do that than walking with a rucksack up 500 and 800 foot inclines to drop into another valley to get a sheep. You know, it, it, yeah. I know we're, we're talking about things and we don't have answers, but yeah, all good. I've got uh, a few questions coming across <coughs> on the airwaves here. Um, I've got one uh, to do with Wolflands actually from do it or from do it. Noel's Noel's way. Okay. I'll say that again. Do it Noel's way. Uh, will we find out who the narrator is for Wolflands? I think we might do t t today. You know, there's a good chance, and uh, you know, it's it's been, it's 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 absolutely, it's so relaxing. That sounds stupid, that doesn't it? To say that we've we've actually done filming, it's really good, and now it's in the hands of Mick Park, who's who I saw, I saw in the chat earlier, and uh, is is partner who, who works with him uh, Nick and my daughter and her husband Jess and they're producing the music and uh, I need to say that I'm uh, we're both not I am we're both so grateful and lucky to have the vocals from Jess uh, and, and the input from Nick her husband mixing the music and things and the creative input from Mick Park and his, his friend Nick because uh, without that the film wouldn't have had, wouldn't have had as much uh, of an impact we also need to say the trailer will not showcase the music. You will have music in, but it will not showcase the music because we've 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 packed it full of witness accounts to sort of show you the content of the film. But you will get to that at around eight o'clock. But I just want to add that bit in case you're thinking, well, I thought you were going to you're talking about the music and it, it, you know it's 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 not what we thought, but it, it will be fabulous a mix. Mick particularly has worked with some of the most influential people within the music industry. And, uh, you know, he, he might not thank me for saying this, but he's worked with you too. He's worked with Ruby Turner. He's, he's worked with Robbie Williams, you know, so he's, he's worked with top names. He knows music. So we're fortunate to have this guy helping us. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, Al is asking. Good question is, Al. I'd ask this question myself. What should we be looking for? What is the difference between a dog print and a big cat print? Well, a good point. Uh, well, at Speeton a few years ago, and if I'd have known that question were coming up, I could have sent a few photographs to Leslie, could have put them up. They've got a huge print, as, as big as my fist. I think people saw it in Truth Proof 4. I put a picture of my hand against the print. Massive print. And we'll get to your, answer your question in a moment, uh, you know, because... I spoke to, I think, the Chickahominy Indians. A friend of mine, Peter, used to live with the tribe and we sent them the pictures. And uh, and with the comparison of my hand, they haven't got huge hands, but they thought incredibly huge wolf. 
We don't have wolves in the UK. I suppose it could have been a mastiff, but that's a Spaten. But what's the difference? Usually, you, you will you'll not see claws in a print. You know, so to get a nice clean mud print of a cat. The claws are retracted. A dog print, you'll see the claws, and the pads look different as well. You know, so obviously there is a marked difference, and uh, there'll be people out there a lot more professionally qualified to talk about prints than me but i know that we've got claws in this big print that we're looking at i don't by any means think it's a cat uh steve 71 is asking paul do you know if you will be doing any lectures this year yeah um i was speaking at the awakening uh august the 25th to the 27th and uh, i'm quite looking forward to it you know, and they've, they've got a great lineup of speakers. I probably it's probably the biggest conference in the UK, and yeah, now I'll, I'll, I'll be speaking there. I'm going to speak about uh, the night people. So it'll be the first time I've ever spoken about my experiences from childhood, kind of thing, to present day. But 90, I, I always say 1998. It kind of dried up for me, which I'm pleased it did. Uh, although things have happened, but nothing of any any great substance. In public, you know, to actual p physical bodies sat in front of me. So, yeah, a bit daunting, but I'm going to do it. Yeah, busy year for you then, Paul. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, Basil Fawlty. Sorry, yeah, Paul. Well, well just Hold while we're on, and there's also Chris Evers' conference, the Outer Limits conference, uh, and I'd, if Chris wants to put the date in the chat, please do, you know, because uh, that's... Always worth attending. Thank you. Basil Fawlty is asking, is it possible the big cats are coming through a time energy portal? I don't know. Uh, you, you, it's, it might not be as crazy as it sounds. I, 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 have to, I have to say that I do think that these cats are here and the part of the reason they're here is what I touched on earlier. The, 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 the Wildlife Act of 1976, cats that people have bought that have outgrown their, well, people's comfort zones and they've let them go. I even know that, uh, well, I say I know, I've even been told that the American military bases in the United Kingdom used to keep pumas as mascots and they'd let them go. You know, I've not, I've not got a particular base I could talk about or anything. And if I had, I probably wouldn't say. But are they coming through portals? Uh, my gut feeling is that they're, they're here. It just seems, I find it, quite quirky that they're here in places where we're finding things of high strangeness however i do have to keep going on about short lane which is in between bempton and bridlington a nondescript one mile long lane just hawthorn edges down the side arable land to the left if, if you're going towards bridlington and grazing land to the right and the archives of the newspapers the, the Bridlington newspapers, the witness reports that have come to me, talk about big black cat sightings on short lane. There's nothing there. There's no quarries, there's no forests, there's nothing. So why are people seeing them on short lane? So there might be a place for your theory there, you know? That's, that's up as, as close as I could get to it. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's uh, flat agricultural land, isn't it, really, it either is, yeah. side of short lane. And you can see for quite a while... Uh, you know, you can see far distance trees. You can trees, see to salt so. endless. You can see literally yeah. see to to hull. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, if you, if you if you actually stood on short lane, you can see vast amounts of the countryside you around can. You can, left yeah. or right of the road. Can't Which you? doesn't seem yeah. like an ideal place for for a big no. stealth for a stealthy animal to, to yeah, hide to itself. Seen. Yeah, yeah. People people claim to see cats. Tell me about uh, Betty Chadwick's puma uh, report. 1994 once again uh, and it's, it's I've spoke to Betty uh, you know over the years I've spoke to her quite a few times but when I was writing the first book uh, I found this report in the archive of the Bridlington Free, Free Press and I managed to locate this lady and went to speak to her and she'd actually got photographs of the cat which I had to take she couldn't find the actual photographs she's got them she'd got them on a tablet so I had to take photographs off the from the tablet and do the best I could with them. But basically, Betty and her husband 
they were going to the uh, flower show at to, uh, Burton Agnes Hall and they were early. So they drove to Rudston, which is just about a mile away, parked in a lay-by, it's actually called Rudston Parva, so cloth shot of Rudston. And just sat waiting, it's a nice day, there's nothing spoiling. So there's Betty and her husband, 1994. So they sat on this road, to the right of them, there's a field with uh, Frisian cows in, black and white cows. Why am I saying that? It will become apparent. I said, hedgerow around the field. I can picture it now. There's cattle in it now. Or I think there is, because I passed a few days ago going to drift with my daughter, Laura. There's some overhanging trees which cows had been sheltering in, and this can see a beige calf under one of the trees, which they thought were odd, because these are, these are Frisians. They're not uh, Jersey cows, you know, because everyone knows the Jersey's a beige cow. So watching it, it's no great conspiracy. It's no great mystery. They're just watching it. And then it stands up. Now they're both into wildlife. They realise instantly they thought it were a female lion. Its tail goes in the air and it sprays the tree. They actually see it doing this. So there's a physical to this thing. Camera out, take a picture of it. Uh, they realised it wasn't a lion, but it was a very large beige cat puma. It took no notice of them. They didn't say anything. They just sat observing in care, walked along the hedgerow and into the field and disappeared. And they've got a series of photographs which they let me, Betty let me take photographs. I saw her a few months ago, funnily enough, and I, I, I sort of pushed her again to find the original photographs so I can get some images scanned off the originals. But the pictures in the book, the Truth Proof book, now there's a there's a fence around the field, three bar wooden fence. <coughs> yeah. You can clearly see this is a lot bigger than a domestic cat. So an interesting sighting, and once again, 1994. Les, and what's <coughs> excuse me, what's interesting is that this is Rudston Parva. A little bit later in the year, and I've talked about this one before. There's a lady, I'm not going to say a surname because it's really, really distinctive, although the papers mentioned it. So I suppose it's in public domain, domain but I won't. And she's, she can hear her children in the, in the other room while she's in the kitchen with her husband. So to talking about seeing something in the garden and what is it? And they're getting quite animated. And uh, so what was she looking at? And they're going, oh, I know it's, it's a lion. It's, it's this, it's that and the kids are saying. So they go into the room and look out of the window and they, they claim there's a lioness in the garden. So we've got this sighting, we've got this report, and then it, it created so much interest. The, the, the authorities were so convinced. So once again, we're talking about, uh, are any uh, official bodies interested in these things? Obviously, they took this seriously. They put two helicopters up. <clears throat> from RAF Leckenfield, 21 armed police officers, not one, 21, and they searched for this lioness. Nothing was found, nothing was ever found. But what's fascinating, over the following weeks, once again, we've got this concentration that seems to, seems to erupt, almost erupt like a rash for three or four weeks and then just they're gone. Where they gone? Over the next few weeks, there's a painter and decorator. I, the name escapes me, but it's in the paper. So this is Betty's were documented in paper as well. Betty Chadwick, they went to paper with theirs. Uh, there's a painter and decorator driving home through Waldgate. How far's Waldgate from Rudston? A mile. Claims that there's a lioness running along the side of his van. It's, it's, it's absolutely nuts. But... You, if it's not hard enough to get your, your head around these things, Les, what, what, what I find yeah. equally fascinating is the fact that they can be seen and where are they going when the, when the sightings stop? Where, where yeah. do they go then? So, yeah. so does that throw a bit of light onto the theory of, what, of the question that came up two or three questions before and are they going somewhere else? I, I, I don't yeah. necessarily subscribe well, to that, but I find it fascinating. I'm just going to throw in a bit of a curveball here, Paul. I'm going to just switch my because, fire on. Because, uh, oh, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you've got to keep warm. Uh, and it's this, really, is um, what percentage of these uh, big cat sightings are seen in daylight hours as compared to nighttime? 
Well, because, because I'll play a bit of a devil's advocate. Could uh, some of these sightings, if the light is dim, uh, be uh, be another normal domestic type of animal? Yeah, yeah, good point. Could uh, uh, as somebody misidentifying a big dog? Yeah. Yeah, but good point. However, Betty's sighting was. I would assume if we're waiting for Rudston Flower Show to open, I would have thought it were about half past ten in the morning. It'll have been opening yeah. at eleven. Uh, the Wald Gate one, the guy's coming home from work. It wasn't dark, so, so so we know that he saw that in daylight. The the one at Rudston Parva where the children saw the, the saw the cat and the and the parents thought, what are these two talking about? And went and saw it. That would have come daylight sighting. The the Rudston panther setting the tree were a nighttime sighting. Now. Uh, we probably would have got to this later, but myself and Bob Brown have seen one, and that were a nighttime sighting. But my car headlights hit hit its back and the tail. Uh, I don't know, five seconds more, my car would have hit it. <laughs> you know, so but you know, we we've just we've just left Bempton. We're coming down. We're approaching Juson Lane, just just before the bend of Juson Lane. We both saw it clearly. If Bob's in chat, he can he can tell people. He can say what he wants. And the grass is quite long, and this thing we just saw its tail on on the road, really long tail, and we saw its back above the grass. I, I turned the corner, pulled into a gate, put a torch on. There's nothing there. I don't mean it disappeared, but it wasn't there. But what's interesting, uh, we've got cryptid reports on Juice and Lane. This weren't a cryptid. This were a big black cat. Well, it's fascinating, you know. It really is. More questions, people, if you've got them. And you know, we've. I know we're. Where are we? Nineteen thirty-eight, and uh, yeah. Where is it? It's for Coca-Cola as well. It's, it's absolutely brilliant. It's, it's a little community and it's, it's so good. And I, I, I make no excuses now, people. When, when it's finished, the live stream, and I start saying goodbye to people and thanking them, I wish I'd not done it because there's so many people you want to say thank you to and you, you just can't get through it. So I don't think I'm being rude if, I'm, if I miss you out because I'm not doing it uh, deliberately. Yeah, I just missed uh, the sound uh, issue on that one. I'll just repeat the question. It was just thanking everybody for uh, supporting us over the last few months, coming on the live streams, support, super chats, and uh, welcoming any newcomers to the tonight's stream as well. So uh, I'll move on with a the question then, Paul. Yeah. Uh, let's have a look then. Um, right, Clinton Ham. Uh, welcome to tonight's uh, show, Clinton. Uh, my cousin saw Panther between Faversham and eight, ATE, if that's the, the place name. So that's quite interesting. Yeah, yeah and if you, if you want to speak to me afterwards, if you want to email me, uh, Paul, all lowercase, Paul Sinclair, ILF, at gmail.com, I'd love to hear about it because there's one thing that the, the reports and the books that I've written are doing now. The, the first book pretty much concentrated in East, East Yorkshire primarily, more than North Yorkshire. The second book, we had a mixture of both. Third book, fourth book, started to branch out. And now I've got reports from all over the UK. And I suppose I will eventually write another book, but I'm so engrossed with Wolflands and some, some future projects that I want to get on with them as well at the moment. Yeah. So I know uh, an early question from uh, Basil Fawlty was on about uh, time and energy portals. Uh, Patricia Adams-Wright is asking, one specialist said we may have to look at other worldly avenues for explanations. What do you think? Yeah, I, th I think this is true. I mean, and, and isn't that what we're doing? It, I mean, everybody within the, the chat, unless you've just come on, and I haven't seen that, by the way, just to, just to be sarcastic or pull down what people say and what people think, we're all looking for answers and we're all looking down other roads that are different to the norm, should we say. So, yeah, we, I think we've got to do. Think outside of the box. 
A great question here from Jay, Jay Austin. Uh, welcome to tonight's stream, Jay. Hi, Paul. Are the majority of accounts mainly puma or panther or any other species? So where, do, where does the split lie? That's a good point. Yeah, I, I, we get the big black cat, and I, I'll probably pronounce this wrong, but a lot, uh, I think a lot of the experts, you, you know, because I've said before, we've got people who sort of claim that they're big cat researchers and UFO researchers and never the two will meet. But a lot of the big cat experts, well, is, it, is it a menalistic leopard? I've probably pronounced it wrong, uh, which is a, a black leopard. But it kind of goes against the grain of what what the leopard is because we're not seeing fatalities. And I don't know. We, we, I'd, I'd have thought more puma-based than actual big black panthers and true leopards. But the black ones, do we have black pumas? I don't know. Uh, I, thought, I thought they were beige. You got they go by a few names, don't yeah. they? The puma, the mountain lion, the cougar, the puma. But I always thought they were beige or, or light brown in colour. And to see the black yeah. ones, what we saw, what myself and Bob saw, was black. I saw the yeah. back of it and the tail. No, I know you. You talked about a story earlier on about uh, there's two nesting uh, pairs of. Uh, well, they're not panthers. nesting. They're not, not nesting. Parents. No, I'll get that right. <laughs> yeah, uh, 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 but what evidence is out there to suggest that they've, they've made a den? They're, they're eating in this area. I know you talked about uh, sheep remains uh, over a fence. Uh, other than that, what other evidence is there, Paul? Oh, I don't think there is, Les. You know, I think I think that it's the predation on the wildlife. I mean, if they're going to kill a deer deep in these forests and, and take it as a food source, I mean, the places that we've been, myself and Chris, uh, <clears throat> these last few years, I don't think there's been much footfall in those areas. And I, I know for a fact, after speaking to the gamekeeper who's been involved in Wolflands, uh, he'll, he will tell you himself after working for a few years in the forests around Stape and the Kel I think he said Keldy and um, Crockton. Yeah. Unless you've got a reason to go off those logging roads and those paths, you're not going to do it. He he worked yeah. for uh, for at least a year, two years, yeah. before he even found the farmhouse, which was in an area where he was working, an abandoned farmhouse. So it's there. I'd, everything that we're dealing with, and I'm, and I'm sorry for sound, making this sound so weak, is anecdotal. And and that's not good yeah. enough for most people. But uh, anecdotal evidence on mass has to be taken seriously. Adds weight. I think, I think uh, uh, a key to finding more about this, Paul, lies in with uh, uh, what you do with UFO investigations and reports, is that you've really got to go, especially UFOs, we are ahead with your eyes looking at the skies all the time. I think with the, the big cats, it, it'd be more about looking on the ground for the prints, because obviously if you're walking along a well-trodden forest road, there's lots of prints in there from previous people who walk into dogs and yeah. there's dog prints and what have you. So the key would be sort of differentiating, going back to the, uh, to the, uh, the difference between cat and a dog, paw prints and all that, would be to differentiate between what what is there on the ground already. So really, you've got to you've got to examine everything on that ground. If, if you are a, a you know a, an avid researcher of these things, yeah, and and we we've done it, and that's why we we identified that the huge prints that we found in the ravine at Spaten were were dog. They were canid, you know. So. Well, I, I, I'm not, not subscribing to the idea that it's a huge wolf, but we compared to the size of my hand, the, 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 the bigger, which is, is, is just a massive print. But having said yeah. that, I was at Speeton with my miniature dog, the new dog the other day, Bobby Wolf, and got speaking to a guy there. <clears throat> and obviously you don't just jump in. I've said this many times with what you're actually looking into. So I always think the big cat is a good staple starting point to gauge whether somebody's open to the idea that things of an unexplained nature can be out there. And as soon as he started talking, he goes, well, I spoke to a lady in Bridlington who was uh, near the pond at the back of the ravine where we found the dog prints. And she says, you'll never guess what I've just seen. Well, I knew what she were, he was going to say. And I went, a cat, a big cat. He went, yeah. He said, she said, she saw a big black panther. 
it's too numerous. I have too many reports. And what's interesting, you've been down there, Les. It's the cliff is a sheer 400 foot drop, but we can get down as you come up a little bit further. And, and it, obviously it's going to go down at a gradient of about 400 feet at a 45 degrees. And it's tough going because it's not a path with steps. It's sludge and, and hard going. So it doesn't get a lot of footfall. Yet we've got big cat reports down there when there's not a lot of people actually about in that area. So that kind of tells you that, that that whatever it is, whether it's one or two, they're there. You know, we've got a report of a strange, excuse me, uh, jelly-like light, at the, like almost like a Howard Hughes summed it up perfectly when I spoke on Howard. He says, like, like somebody would draw one of those big bubbles on an oval, like a tic-tac shape, on the beach, four foot off the ground. Uh, I think probably the witness is in the chat. And on a bright sunny day, and this lady and her husband saw this thing and they can they, they could to the point of nearly walking around it that close a child nearly ran into it and it's just there like a shimmering is that a portal i don't know what you'd call it but it's it's, it's a fabulous thing that they must have seen and then you've got i've got numerous reports ufo related the guy who saw the spheres of light leaving the cliff i think he saw about six of them with a red light on top and we estimated this stretched out over at sea, these spheres probably a mile and all moved in unison and then retracted back. No, I'm not saying there's UFOs going into the cliffs at Speyton. I'm saying that's what he perceived when he saw these lights coming from the face of the cliff. So there's no openings, people. There's no secret trap doors. I'm not trying to say that. So let's not get too sensationalist, even if that's what it sounds like. You know, but we've, that we've got these reports. Well, we've got about 12 minutes before the exciting 8 o'clock uh, buzzer <laughs> goes. And uh, let's have a look. Uh, where do you want to go to next? Do you want a question or do you want uh, to anything, to anything you want, Les? And let's just, let's just ask the listeners if, if you've got, when you watch this 15 or whatever it is minute clip for Wolflands, if you've got questions, just, just bang them in the chat and let's, let's, just, let's just fire through them. Let's, let's hear your thoughts. Good or bad, oh, you know. Definitely, I'd love to yeah. We'd we'd be more than welcome to uh, get some uh, initial feedback on what you see tonight. Yeah. Uh, right then. So I'll go on with. Um, ah, did we um, touch on the Cliff Lane sighting with the caravanners? Uh, <coughs> so for people who don't know where Cliff Lane is, yeah, can you uh, just point out? Uh, Geographically, where Cliff Lane is. Okay, so I'm in Bridlington, approximately three or four miles away from Bempton. Little village, Bempton, people have heard me talk about it before, and that's where a lot, we, we do a lot of the research, but we're not in the village. So the people within the village who think that all of this is just kind of make believe, it will be when you've got your curtains drawn and you're watching your TV soaps, for those of you that are listening now or listening afterwards, because you need to get into the remote places the places where things are happening so cliff lane you leave the village and it's about three quarters of a mile long single track road that leads you to the rspb bird sanctuary and that's the base the hub and then to the right there's flamborough and to the left you've got buckton speet and reeton and up towards filey so you've got all these remote cliffs but at the bottom of cliff lane well about i don't know 500 yards up there's a caravan park, Cliff Lane Caravan Park. <laughs> Simply enough, isn't it? A few of the locals up there walking their dogs were reporting seeing a large black cat on the lane, crossing the lane. And I think the year was 2016 to 2017. And to, to the point where, I mean, I, I, I went to the caravans and interviewed these people. Yeah, first of all, I got a report. I got one report. I think it was Bob Brown that that uh, alerted me to it. Bob worked in a charity shop in Bridlington and someone came in, you, people get talking and they said they're, they're holly, holidaying. Obviously, they, I don't know how many weeks of the year they can stay in these caravans, but if they've bought one and you're living in, say, Leeds, Bradford, Doncaster, wherever you're living and you're retired, you might want to spend summer in your caravan in, you know, close to the sea and that's what they were doing. But the dog walkers in particular were seeing this cat, not a domestic cat. And uh, this this thing were black. Interestingly, they said it had tufts on its ears. Uh, so 
th there you go, the Cliff Lane sighting, but Cliff Lane once again. Christmas Day 2018, I believe, a guy, a good friend of mine, so that's how I got this one, uh, ended up walking up. Christmas Day morning, about 6, between 6 a.m. and 7 o'clock, crisp, frost-covered morning, and he's walking up Cliff Lane. There's, there's nothing there. There's a couple of bungalows. There's a caravan site on the right, a couple of bungalows, that's three, and then a pig farm which is now closed but it, it were operational then and fields and he sees an object over the fields triangular shaped object three orange lights and he's looking at this incidentally this is where i saw the triangle in the pea crop which we got the photographs of back on june the 15th 2017 this thing moves he said like a printer no noise it's dark so there's nobody got a drone we can't hear anything whizzing about and he's looking at it and it, it suddenly it's just gone to other side at other side at road and he carries on walking up the lane and then it's over the pig farm then it comes a bit closer to him and then he feels uneasy he doesn't feel threatened he just starts to feel uneasy and thinks i'm going back i went back home told me the story cliff lane that's not the only one on cliff lane but if you come off cliff lane you've got the you've got what's called blake howl lane which is meaning black in the terminology of Bempton and Flamborough people, Blake is black. And we've got Black Howe, which is a burial mound. Quite a few stories around Black Howe Lane. Once again, earthworks in ancient places. And I've got to say at this juncture, for our American friends who may be on the stream tonight, uh, we don't have large predatory animals in the UK. Uh, Paul, if you want to pick up on that one. Well, no, it, it, that's that's a fact. We've we've got nothing like that. And you know, when we jump into uh, the, the likes of what we've been filmed, the people we've been filming, and the accounts we've been told, although we've not got no accounts of anybody being injured, the things that they've seen, but are quite honestly, in in the name of someone else, not me, the things of nightmare. You know, but. Uh, uh, we, we'll get to we'll get to that in a few minutes, I suppose. But uh, yeah, it's fascinating. Okay, well, it's, uh, a few minutes to go before the top of the hour, and I'll go through some questions, then, Paul. Okay. Uh, thanks for all the questions tonight, guys. Uh, always welcome. We we love trying to get through. Uh, I prefer most of questions, the questions if I'm being truthful. It saves me thinking uh, uh, <laughs> too much. You know, you've got to think on your feet. I'm always better. Yeah, um, so Chris from the Outer Limits magazine. Uh, welcome to the show, Chris. Hi, Chris. Uh, yeah, um, do you think uh, the big cat sightings are related to the animal mutilation reports? I think well, it's we... mutation on it, but I think he means... Uh, I, uh, yeah, I know what you mean there, Chris. But, yeah, uh, the, area, the areas overlap. Uh, the areas overlap of sightings of cats and mutilation reports. Yeah, uh, yeah, they do overlap, Chris, but... I can only say based on what I've found that, that when when we were heavily, heavily involved in 2017 to early 2019, I don't think that big cats were responsible for whatever was happening to the, the wildlife. And remember sheep, badger, roe deer, fox. And I've done it earlier in the show, Chris, but all these animals, the, 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 the devastating injuries that they received it, it, well, I'm saying devastating. It looked more precision than devastating. You know, when you've seen ears removed and eyes removed and and and, and the clean cuts. So, no, I don't think the cats were responsible. It, the quickest answer I could say, Chris. <clears throat> okay, then I've got Alden Rain. Uh, thing is, Paul, it wasn't a big cat that dangled that ladder up by his calf in Good that point, forest. Yeah. That, that, well, that, that's correct, and what you're referring to, Aldo Rain, is uh, our our friend who kindly did us an interview a few weeks ago, and uh, had that experience in Warncliffe Woods uh, many years ago, and and it, no, it weren't a big cat that did that. That was that was some huge bipedal creature, and I can't remember if I think people will have to look back at the show and look in the the chat but somebody really did come up with a 
a, a, an interesting explanation to what might have been going on. And I, I kind of rung true with me, and I maybe should have messaged them, but they said they thought that the guy who got picked up, and if I, I know a lot of people in the chat will be familiar with the story, uh, were meant to disappear. Uh, they messed up, basically. This is what the guy who replied in the chat said. He thinks that, that whatever did it messed up and it should have just took him. And then the next morning, the boys, the lads who'd been asleep, would have woke up and thought their friends wandered off and it'd have either never been found or something would have been found sometime later. And it was a good point. You know, I mean, I, I suppose there's loads of ways of looking at it and we'll never know. But for something to have remained so vivid in in this guy's memory for so long, uh, it's a it's a fabulous account. But yeah, you're right. And I've talked earlier, didn't I? I said nobody actually got injured by these things, and this thing, well, it, it well it injured his calves, and who knows what intent it it, it, it wanted to do? Because that's that was well, the essence of the the guy who replied to the yeah. to us afterwards, because he said like. It, once, once it, once the cover had been blown, they, they wouldn't take three. There would have been too much suspicion on whatever it was that was doing it. Although, you know, part of me thinks, well, yeah, but if you're that elusive, if you can slip in and out, in and out of our existence, why would you be bothered? I don't know. Okay, I might just squeeze another question in, or a couple of questions here. One's not so much a question. It's from uh, UFO Nut. <laughs> Uh, NUT, UFO nut. Oh, yeah. Hi, Paul and Les. Black Panther is either a black leopard or a black jaguar. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, th don't they call it the amenalistic or I, I can't pronounce it, but uh, yeah, you're correct because I still think you can see the markings actually if you look closely uh, uh, at these uh, these cats. But my gut feeling is, I mean, if it's a, if it were a black jaguar. I mean, that's in the Amazon jungle. Yeah. That's the ultimate predator. That's the thing everything fears. We would be on the menu. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. and we don't seem to be on the menu for these things. Yeah. And, uh, well, I've got to ask why, don't you think? We're not on the menu, Paul. I don't know. Uh, I don't, I don't, a good point, because I don't necessarily think they are. I think they may be pumas, although we, we, you, there's plenty of videos on YouTube and examples of pumas uh, stalking humans. So I don't really know. Do I believe that they're there? Hundred percent. You know, I can't not believe it. I've seen one, but uh, I don't have an answer, guys. I, I do apologise. I, I, well, I don't. I just don't know. Yeah, and for those uh, not familiar with this part of the world, uh, just tell me how big these forests are in North Yorkshire. Well, you know, the actual entirety of the forests of North Yorkshire, the North no Yorkshire Moors National Park. It's about 525 square miles. So we're going up the coast. We don't we don't talk about East Yorkshire in that, but when we get to North Yorkshire, we're going up the coast and then inland. And like I said, there's, there's vast swathes of forest, wood and farmland. And most of it's separated just by names. You know, you, they're all accessible. They're all interlinked. It's fabulous. Even the place names are fascinating and relate to the, the unexplained. It's... Well, it looks like to me, looking at the clock, Paul, we're at that magic hour. It's like Christmas, and isn't it? Really? It's, it's like Christmas all over again. <laughs> and uh, for anybody who's coming to the chat uh, on tonight's stream, thanks for joining us. We are now going to play a 15-minute uh, uh, teaser, trailer, sizzler, whatever you want to call it, uh, for Wolflands, uh, a film to release this year. And uh, it features some good, very good, accounts that we've can i just done. add one thing les uh this is a youtube link people so the quality is good but it won't be anything like the quality that you will see in the finished product here we go there's a little bit of a black lead in guys so don't think it hasn't started when it comes on we are going to go hopefully if i press the right buttons All I could see was this black outline, big black outline looking in at me. I could see more of its muzzle sticking out and kind of its ears. 
some kind of definite feeling inside me that this wasn't man-made. Oh my God, what is that? And I, we all just stood there and it was, I never felt fear like that before. These accounts will take you on a journey along the rugged coastline of East and North Yorkshire and on to the moors. Quaint Alandus from the past to the present, where people from all walks of life claim to have seen incredible beasts. These are the stories of the Wolflands. I noticed something on the roundabout which was, looked very strange. Didn't really know what it was, but as we got closer, it looked like a, a very large dog is the only thing I could describe it as. We decided to drive down to Bempton. And the plan was uh, to watch the Peregrine Falcons down there in full flight. When we'd arrived, it was pretty late, but that was always the plan. We're both ex-military and we like wild camping. We've not been walking long when we meet. When it's taught, he lit up a pair of huge yellow eyes and he said, what the fuck is that? And I mean, they were huge. They were like, they were like as big as a pair of golf balls. But whatever it was, it just looked away and then we couldn't see it anymore. Whatever is being seen in and around the area of Flixton appears to have been resident from the earliest of times. I have collected reports from the 1930s through to present day, and they all share one common theme, the description of a huge bipedal hound. It's certainly possible there was a shape-shifting community in this area, given there are so many other supernatural uh, occurrences. Nothing and no one escaped the strangeness, as one man discovered to his horror 11 miles further up the coast at Scalby Mills. So as I'm settling down, I hear a noise over to the left. It's a good distance away, 20, 30 metres away. I've heard this noise in the brush. It sounds like an animal, but it sounded like a relatively big, something decent size. Yeah. Then I've become aware that the, uh, the atmosphere has changed. Sort of, I can't hear the waves anymore. I can't really hear any, uh, any wind. Insect noise has pretty much gone. It's just still. It's like someone's pressed pause. He heard a strange sound. He said he heard like a growl um, because there were some geese in the background. If you remember, I was telling you before, um, and he could hear the geese when the kind of the sound sort of dropped, and those geese just went silent after the wind dropped down. It was all kind of quite atmospheric. It was about half a state that I'd been at night. I'd gone on a mountain bike ride, not took into account how quick the nights are coming in. Um, it was about a 28 mile ride, ended up on the moors and what have you, and basically before I even entered Langdale Woods, it was pitch black. It's all downhill on there, so you're doing maybe 20, 25 miles an hour sort of thing. So you're not hanging about, no, no, are you? Top gear on the bike fairly quick. Um, when something basically started running along probably a couple of metres to the side of me. So roughly this is, this, this ditch here is roughly where I was when I was uncut down that night and the tree that was, the, the trees are behind it but the branches sort of bend down over the top, so it, I was covered over, looking out towards the house. From the, the left-hand side, there was a ride, a clearing to the left, and out of there, it came walking down, or moving down, shall we say, and its head was sort of just where, where the, the board line is there, where the roof tiles, as you can see, its head above that, and as it moved, it moved smooth. It didn't move like it was stepping over like the, the tufts of sieves and stuff. 
it just came in moving, just very steady, very, and straight to the window. 45 minutes later, and we've arrived at the bottom. Pretty arduous, steep, and I can see now, Steve, why when you said you were actually trapped in that wood when it happened. Yeah. Because there's just no way you would have got out, is there? We used to play a game called Fox and Hound. We'd have a team that would hide, a team that would hunt. Anyway, we started playing the game and I was on the uh, hiding team. So I hopped into this little bit of woodland. And I was sat, like, cuddled up tight. Then uh, I was maybe in there for five minutes or so and I heard a twig snap. I asked my husband if he would pull in to our, at Mary Lee's because I'd seen something on the roundabout and I wanted to go back and have a look. We pulled back out onto the road um, and I asked him to go very slowly along here, but I wanted him to lock the doors because I was frightened to what I'd actually seen. Travel two miles from Flixton and you arrive at Hunmanby. Its name literally meaning farmstead of the Houndman. A fitting name for a land where people claim to see monsters. Continue on towards the coast and your eyes settle on the mighty cliffs of Speeton. It is along this wild and rugged coastline that stories of phantom hounds with huge glowing eyes have been told from ancient times to present day. We were driving towards this location probably about a quarter of a mile away. I said, what do the lights look like? And you looked out of the window and you said, like that. And we looked off to the right, which would have been out to the east coast. And they appeared in groups of three to four. They came on and went off almost in succession, which was unusual. I have been fortunate enough to have been given correspondence between Tony Dodd and another researcher from the late 1990s. Within the correspondence, we found a letter that claims strange creatures and animal mutilations were nothing new to the forests of North Yorkshire. That, along with an audio recording, intrigued us enough to visit the area on a cold winter's day in 2022. The limestone has been seven bodies over a period of time removed from them fields up there. And the response, obviously, of the London Takers, we have no idea, seven is only the tip of the iceberg. We're back in forest, Jeff. Yep. Probably 12 months since you first told me about this. Yeah, it would have been about this time last year, I think. Wasn't yeah. It? What does it feel like coming back? It's um, there's been a lot. Of, it's changed a lot because they've, they've felled a lot of the woodland that's not been sort of touched for the last 70 years. So. Right. That thing you saw then. Yeah. Do you think it's still up here? I don't see any reason why not. Um, no way else, is there? No. So it's approximately two years now since you were back in this forest. What's it feel like? Well, I've been apprehensive. I know we've only like just arrived and it's got with kit art and yeah. settling now, but because I've been busy, take my mind off it, that when, I, when we got here earlier, I was a bit nervous, apprehensive, I, all like all day yeah. yesterday. I think. It's a little bit too early for us to replicate it, definitely. Yeah, I see. Yeah. If you all weren't here. Oh, yeah, oh, as in replicate, you mean coming back on your own? And doing it all over yeah. again. Describe what kind of animal you think could have created that impact on Earth and coming towards you. At, at the time when I could hear it, I just expected it to be, a, if it was a bull, it was a big bull, but that sort of just, it was heavy the, in, in the earth, but in the, the energy what came towards me, it wasn't, it wasn't light-footed, it wasn't trying to be light-footed, it was bounding, but booming towards me. I could feel it, I could feel it in the air, I could feel it in the ground. It so was, there was a pressure? It was big. Can you describe to me and Chris what happened, what happened to make it escalate, this situation? 
about two or three meters towards it, thinking any animal yeah. is is gonna that is gonna that yeah. yeah yeah we say they're gonna be timid. Fox, anything, yeah. We probably don't realise that we've seen them, and when they know that we've seen it, it it's gonna it's yeah, gonna yeah. school. So I took three or four steps forward towards it, threw my arms about a bit and made a few hissing noises. I turned back and walked back towards and Steve. And that's when I saw them two, the, the jaw had dropped, really. And I turned back round and I was just like, oh my gosh, what is that? And I, we all just stood there and it was, I've never felt fear like that before. Could you really mistake that for a human body? Apart from shape, it is devoid of anything. Eyes, discernible mouth, ears. It's a tailor's dummy. So I'm laid there on the floor in the sleeping bag on my belly, thinking I, I can't get out of the sleeping bag because I'm fucking zipped up in it. Yeah. Even if I did get out, what am I going to do? And I'm just hoping, because the way that shadow falls, I'm hoping that I'm just below where the light's coming, what, what little light is yeah. coming in from the window. So I'm hoping it can't actually see me, but it's obviously looking in for some reason. So I'm laid there and I watched it, and probably five minutes, it moved off. So I then spent the next few hours sort of awake listening to every little crack every little just wondering if yeah where but, yeah it? waiting for something to either come through door or roof or whatever so the the two front doors locked the back door didn't lock so i had to barricade i used to put a piece of wood across that to yeah. hold that shut and then i had an inside door to the room i was in but i'd stick some up against that yeah. as well so in reality though the, this thing that you saw what do you think if you ever wanted to get in it could have gone through a wall it were it were big The eyes rose perfectly, as if it were machined. Really? Just don't know, get in or bought it. No. It just went like a machine, just, just, just rose. So when I turned around, there was just this thing really close looking at me, and it was huge. Had massive shoulders. Yeah. Massive head. And when I, I rubbed my eyes and looked again, it just like twisted its head like a curious dog. The anxiety in me just switched on from where I can't tell you. Proper fear. I was terrified. I was absolutely terrified. Then things turned for the worse. This thing had stood up, like stood up on two legs, and at this point the dogs were properly terrified. We all were. I think it was about, about seven feet tall, and it just stared at us. You got like a weird feeling. It, I can't, I can describe it as fear. I don't really know because you're looking at something that's huge and you're thinking, if I start to make a noise or try and go towards it, that thing can be up there in a heartbeat. Right now, looking into that darkness, those eyes reappearing back there. Just coming in at time. It's a bit even more scary than last time, I think. To this day, I'd spend every penny to know what it was. Yeah. If okay. I could find out what it was, I literally would spend every penny I've earned to find out what it was. Just to give you an answer. Yeah. We are back, Paul. Yes. Are you back on there, Paul? Yep. Oh, we're back. We're back live. Okay. Okay, one second, guys. We're back live now, Paul. Yeah, all good. Thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, I found myself, I've watched it loads of times. I was watching it again. And yeah, uh, I hope you found that interesting, people. And. Uh, Obviously, there's a lot more to it. We're going for an hour and a half, aren't we, Les? The finished product, thereabouts. Yes, I've just got to say, at this juncture, I've lost the picture of us both. It's gone <laughs> somewhere in the ether. So it's just you on the screen. That's all I've got to no, say no, at this worries. moment. It's all good. So 
questions, people, please, and uh, whatever it is you want to talk about. But uh, yeah, we've we've done quite a bit on big cats, and I think uh, yeah, give you a few things to think about. You know, I know you've only seen fifteen minutes of that, and it's a conden condensed version, a conglomerate of most of the things that are in the film. Obviously, you can't get a grip of everything that's there you know the tony dodd research is a full stuff it's almost like a mini film within the film so to see the the stretcher and the, the you know the body being carried off it's just giving you a taste that there's there's a lot of elements in there that uh, that we've added and a lot more to come yeah and uh, as you say paul the uh, there have been many films within a film each one of these uh, scenes uh, seemed like uh, uh, a film in itself, didn't it? So a lot of these are reenact reenactments of uh, the events that were told to us. They are reenactments, Les, but we we need to stress that the people within the forest sat around the fire were the actual witnesses. Uh, you know, but obviously, you know, because we don't. I don't want people to think that we've just acted out and just got an anecdotal evidence. We've actually got, in most cases, we've got the actual witness sat talking with us. And uh, have we got sound people? Yeah, we're, we're on. We're yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, that's okay. Uh, I saw a just question in capitals. I think it was Lemurs said, "Where can we see this, please?" Well, we're still in the process of trying to place the film. We've literally just finished the filming, and as I said earlier, Mick Park and Nick, who he works with, and my daughter and her husband Nick, are producing the music. So, uh, that will be done at end of February. I would have thought some some time. Uh, towards the very end of February, and then we're trying to place it somewhere. Excuse me, we spent that long on it that we can't just put it onto YouTube. It's three years and uh, knocked an hole in Les's life and my own, so you know it's it's not something that we can just sort of put onto YouTube. So when we do place it, obviously you guys are going to be the first to know. Yeah, and. Uh... Yeah, so as Paul says, uh, I think the word in the industry is pitching it out there. Yeah, we've so, it. yeah, we've just got to pitch it uh, and see where we can get that. And, uh, yeah, so obviously, yeah, you'll get the chance to, wherever it goes, folks, uh, you'll get the chance to uh, view it from where it will be uh, put. Oh, there but you eventually, go. Eventually, yeah. I see uh, Sasha. No Sorry, let's go on. Yeah, no doubt. Eventually, it, it will probably make its way to... Uh, DVD, Blu-ray, and whatever, whatever flavour of uh, consumption you want it in. I'm not just cherry picking here, guys, but I, I just saw that Sasha Christie had said, you know, the people within the film c come over as being believable, and that kind of means a lot because uh, some of you will know Sasha, some of you won't, but she does a due diligence and does a lot of research, and if she's passionate about something, she will sniff out something that's fake. Uh, if that's the word for it, Sasha, but uh, you, you will do, and uh, you, you're quite good at what you do. So, and obviously, yeah, thank you. Yep. Yeah, so the only picture I can put up is a full picture of me. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, that's without fine, Les, without, that's without, without, without you on the screen. Oh, yeah. That's good. So everybody you, will want to see that, Liz. Yeah, everybody. You can get into the whiskey now, Paul. You're off screen. <laughs> uh, right. So, yeah, I've just got to uh, echo. Uh, Everything Paul has just said, uh, these people uh, are very, very nervous when they're recounting these events back to us. Some of these events happened years earlier. Some uh, were not um, far in the past. So obviously uh, recounting these can be traumatic for, uh, w for the witnesses. Without a doubt, Les. You know, I mean, the traumatic is the word. And uh, they're not actors. They're real people. They're like yourself, me, and people in chat. They're not actors, and we've never we've we've not prompted them and got them to talk in a certain way. We've just got the accounts as as real and as, probably as graphic as what they can tell tell the accounts. You know, so yeah, all good. Okay, doke. Then I will. Have we got any questions in the chat? Guys, have we got, have we got any forwarded? Uh, is there any questions on the Wolf Lance film, Paul, you can see? Uh, not at the moment. I can see Patricia Wright Adams saying you can actually feel the fear 
uh, or hear the fear, should I say, in, in the voices of some of the witnesses. And that's only on 15 minutes. But yeah, yeah, I mean, and, and, uh, uh, and rightly so. You know, I, I make no, no bones or problems about saying that there were one night when I was up Bempton, and it's not cryptid related, but I was with Steve Ashbridge. And I go, Bob's had the knee operation, so I'm going up there alone at the moment. But this particular night, myself and Steve were up there between 12, 30, uh, 12 and 12.30. And we were in between, midpoint between Flamborough and Bempton. And a fear came over me. I don't know what it was. Didn't see anything. Didn't feel it. Sorry, I felt it. It was just a terrible fear. And, and I was frightened. And, and I've no idea what it was. A lot of people have experienced it. Uh, and I've gone up there years, and that's the only time that that's overtook me. And Steve couldn't feel it. I said, we've got to go. I said, I really feel frightened. And I don't know. Not fr usually frightened of my own shadow. So, yeah. So I can imagine, seeing something like that, I can imagine that, uh, yeah, the fear would have overtaken. So, yeah. Uh, Richard Van, when we'll, when will we see the whole, whole film now? Uh, as I've just said, Richard, if you weren't in when I said it... Uh, we're we're in the process of trying to find somewhere to place the film, so you're just going to have to bear with us, my friend, and uh, it, it will happen. <clears throat> Someone well, asked guess... about PTSD. Yeah, well, brilliant point because that's what a lot of these people are suffering from, post traumatic stress disorder. Do you know, and and nowhere to turn to to talk about these things, and you can throw that net wide ac across the whole genre of unexplained phenomena. And, and it really is frustrating because if we'll not go into the kind of things that people are, are, are spoken to by professionals in the real world when it comes to PTSD, because you, we know that the list is many and varied. But when it comes to this subject, there's nowhere to turn. You need people to talk to, the people with an understanding ear, and also people who are not going to take you into realms of fantasy land if that doesn't sound too crazy when we're dealing with such a subject as this you know yeah and uh yeah so we're hoping that what you've seen tonight gives you a uh a delve into uh most if not all of the accounts that we have in the film and uh it's going to be as paul said on a time frame basis we're kind of like looking at the end of February uh, because we know that's the only time that the full-time work on the the main film, the music, uh, will be more or less completed by then. <clears throat> the music's awesome. So, there's a few there's <clears throat> a few twists in it as well. So yeah. So seeing Preston, are these wolves dogmen? Did they? Did any witness hear bones cracking on the creatures? Uh, are they were dogmen? Are they werewolves? I, I, you know, I think we're just splitting airs with names here. Uh, uh, I'm not really sure. And th they heard a physical presence in Broxa Forest. The guys, the three guys who were sat around, the two guys sat with me, there's Chris Wright sat at the side of me. Chris has been instrumental in making Wolfland's people. Without Chris, the film wouldn't have been the same, without a doubt, because he knows a lot of the locations better than uh, myself and Les. And the guys in Broxa, when this thing first appeared, they thought it was growling at them. It were approximately 42 feet away. And as, as we demonstrate it in the film, when you get to look at the full film, you'll see me with a surveyor's tape measuring where they were that night to the, to the place it appeared. And the lung power on this thing was so strong that they could hear it breathing, but they perceived that as a growl for a few minutes because they just, well, they were just totally alien to anything they'd ever seen or heard before. So, yeah, th there is a physical presence to these things. So, Les, have we got questions? The bone crack, uh, no, sorry, Les, I'm butting in. Uh, somebody's put bone crack when they stand on two legs. No, because as you heard Steve say in the film, when this thing stood up, it was like a machine. It just... He made an analogy. I don't know whether we actually filmed it, but people have, le have heard me talking about it before. He said, if you'd got two ping pong balls in glass tubes, it stood up that smooth. 
It was just like a machine standing up. So the, and he went, he, his body action showed on the 15 minute clip you've just seen. He said there were no movement, uh, like moving about to get up, it just rose. It's been an absolutely yeah. awesome thing to see. And, and just, very uh, yeah, that's, that's right. Um, let's have a look, see if I can. Uh, can't yeah, see it being werewolves, just my thoughts though. But hey, I may be wrong. Well, I think we, we need to we need to sort of clarify what we're going to term as a werewolf. If you're thinking of something that people imagine as being, uh, what's, what's the word, the transformation, what lycanthropy, then yeah, I would agree with you. But we're only talking about a name. You know, the, 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 the name in vogue is the dog man, but it's, it seems like we've got two camps here. And if it's, if it's a dog man, it can't be a werewolf. If it's a werewolf, it can't be a dog man. Why can't they both be the same thing? I think if we people need to jump away, I said it when I, when I talked to Chris Turner and Elusive, they need to jump away from films and silver bullets and full moons because I don't think any of that has any influence on it. Uh, I don't think there's any changing and transformation of the beast. It's just it's just something real that's, that nobody seems to be able to bend their heads around at the moment. Okay, I'll just uh, just go to a tangent for a second. Uh, MKMD Exploration Paranormal is saying, uh, uh, can you tell there's got a slight bit of white noise coming from the mic? <coughs> when Paul's on, it's ever so slight, but you can hear it when you're wearing headphones. What I've got to say at this point, you, um, behind me, is a right mess of equipment. Uh, I'm doing too many different things in this room uh, to be uh, noise isolating uh, equipment in this room. So 2023, I'm hoping, will be a period where I can get some of this uh, um, machinery uh, Set gear just moved so it's not making the noises that you can probably hear over your headphones so uh, yeah I'd, I'd take note of that uh, Mike and uh, we'll, we'll be addressing that this year sooner than rather sooner rather than later right then so um, I'll move on then Paul okay uh, I've probably got a question from um, just going back um, let's have a look uh, Sir Andre is asking when is Wolfland's due? We kind of covered that early on, earlier on, uh, Sir, uh, Sir Andre. So probably the end of February, around about that period of time, is when we'll probably get it out there, and then we have to pitch it to uh, to uh, whoever will take it up. So that's a another feat in itself. Mm -hmm. um, Where are your translations? Uh, any mysterious disappearances of people in that area? Yeah, but do we do we attribute them to the cryptids? <clears throat> I'm not going to do, not without any proof, you know. So yeah, that I, I think people will know that I did cover missing people in the first and the second book, more so in the first book. And uh, why did I write about missing people? Because they've gone missing in mysterious circumstances. But I, I'm not going to label any element of unexplained phenomena to their disappearances. A, I think it's disrespectful to, to the to the people who've gone missing and the families of the people who are left. And if I had proof, then we could go with it, but I've no proof. So we've just got to we've just got to run with the fact that we have got people who've gone missing in, in mysterious circumstances in the locations of high strangeness. So much so that in 2013, December 2013 to January 2014, four people went. You know, uh, two within a no mile radius, one 15 miles away and one 25 miles away, but all along that coast. And I mean, vanished without trace. That's interesting. Uh, it's sad, but interesting. Question from Bob. Uh, hi, is anyone keeping any records of sightings of any kind in different seasons or times of the year in the northern and the southern hemisphere? So globally. Uh, and Bob, I wish they would. I mean, I've put this out. <clears throat> I can only do what I do. And I note certain months and I note certain times and I note uh, certain weather conditions and freak weather conditions. Strange things seem to happen just before or just after. 
and uh, not attributed to the weather. They've not got there's not some kind of boat that sank in a rough sea. I'm not saying that, but there's there's freak weather conditions. But it's something that I've said many times, and I've said on on loads of podcasts that I wish researchers in these these areas where these things are, are happening <clears throat> could get together and correlate the information. Or people, you know, there might be there's probably locations all around the United Kingdom, all around the world, where there's people doing research just as important as what I'm doing and anybody else, but they're just coveting it, not not sharing it with anybody, and just sitting on it. I mean, the guy up at Staxton Wold, great guy. I had a good kind of working relationship with him for about four or five years. We still not fell out. He's got more UFO footage than anybody I know. Anybody. Cameras on sweeping cams in all the rooms of his property, which is isolated, looking out onto the walls. Uh, will he share it with anybody? No. You know, so that's basically, uh, obviously, I, I wish the guy well, but that's going to go to the grave with that man. You know, Richard D. Hall arranged to do a, an interview with him because he reached out to Richard. Uh, I don't know what year. I think we're looking at about 2000. 2010, maybe 2009, I'm not certain. And Richard came to stay for a few days and he dipped out. He wouldn't do it. So the guy contacted me and said, would I speak to him? And that's how I ended up doing the first interview and little video documentary with, with Richard, uh, totally off the cuff. So the, the, uh, there's bound to be people out there, that's what I'm saying, that's got more information and more information that could be key than I'm ever going to have. Or you. <clears throat> Right, I've got a uh, question from Lee Roscoe. It's a good question, this Paul. Um, if I'm going, I'm just going to add a little bit into it because this is what I think he's talking about. Why have I never seen or heard of a big cat in the trees in images? So all the photographs that you see out there, and people say, "Well, here's a photo, and it looks like this, that, X, Y, and Z," uh, but some people can't make make out what what they're looking at. Well, I, I, I can't answer that question. Uh, 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 simple answer is, I mean, why, you, why you've never seen, why have I never seen? I mean, we've, I've only heard about the one at Rudston. I know at Weaver thought that, that the, the, the people in the woodlands around there have found animal carcasses in trees. I found a deer carcass in a tree at Danes Dyke. You know, and that tells me that it's not a fox that's taken it up there or a badger. It's a different kind of animal, and who's going to lift a deer carcass into a tree? I, I don't know. You know, I, you know, there's that, there's that, there's that much information out there in the in the form of witness sightings and anecdotal evidence. But like you've just said, why are you never seeing these photographs? We're not seeing them. Uh, you know, I've, I haven't got an answer to any of this. You know, it's just. Uh, it's as difficult for me as what it is for you guys and frustrating because most of the people within the chat, most of the people who are going to watch this afterwards will be watching because they're looking for answers to their part of the puzzle. And uh, it seems like none of us have the answers to any parts of this puzzle. All the things that happened to me, Les, in childhood, I, I haven't a clue why they happened. Uh, why everything stopped at the age of about 14, 15 and then chose to start when I moved 100 miles away to Bridlington within a few days of moving to that house. It started again. I wish I'd got the answers. I just don't have them. Right. Uh, I think, I don't know if, um, correct us if I'm, if I'm wrong here, Lee, was you, was you, uh, is it pareidolia we're talking about here when he's looking at photos, you see? I don't uh, know. Yeah, where well, you just, you just, people see something, but you may not see it, I may not see it. It's a dark shape, it's within trees, it's a long shot, it's whatever. Well, do, do you know, there's, there's, a lot, there's quite a few reports coming out now. Uh, I, I mean, we've got one, I think, I can't remember which book it's in, I think it's in book three, uh, of, of people seeing, not necessarily uh, some kind of, Paradolia, but there's a guy working at Bridlington. Um, it's like a, a drop in center, it's a big center that were built in 2007 uh, for, for maternity, for mothers, for people with in addiction, all sorts of things. It's a good place for, 
for, for, for the community, should we say, as a whole. But he's working on that. He's done the joinery. And it runs onto a passage at the uh, back of Wellington Road. And this guy, I'll not say his name, and he came outside on a sunny day. There's a church at back of it, Christ Church, they call it. And there's a six-foot steel fence, spikes on top. So isn't that... I'm just sort of admiring bit of work I've done and just stood looking. He says, and along the fence and the passage at the back of the fence is only wide enough for one car running up the back of Wellington Road. He says, and I see this blob, this gel gelatinous blob that I can kind of see fence behind it. it, almost like a mirage, but it's in a blob. It's in a four foot round circular blob. He says, and then it just sets off moving and it's going down the fence. And he watches it. Just an interesting, quirky daylight sighting in Bridlington Town. And then you, in America, I think it was Jan Maccabee, uh, the wife of Bruce Maccabee, the guy who was one of the top photography experts for the uh, American uh, uh, Navy, I think. Uh, somebody will correct me if I've, got, if I've got the military establishment wrong. But she's got a, a hunting stand on her land. And she... Went one day, I'm not sure what she was hunting, but got in the stand and claims that she saw movement in tree and see this gelatin shape of almost human shape. I mean, I, w I want to get Jan Maccabee on Truth Proof to talk about it. Uh, that's something I'm wanting to do. So there's all sorts of variants of these things. Is that pareidolia? I don't know. I, I don't think it is. This is not, we're not looking at, you know, how many times I've, have, have we seen people post on social media a picture of a, a perceived dogman, werewolf, Bigfoot, and they'll post a circle and there'll be some leaves and a twigs and they can see something in it. And I'm thinking, well, you know, unless it's as big as an action man or a, or a, a big leaf, you know, I can, you can see all sorts in everything, can't you? A lot of, a yeah. lot, lot of it's just yeah. fantasy. I, I mean, uh, no disrespect to some of these people who post these, but some of these are like a, a repostings of repostings of repostings. Yeah, yeah. So what you've done, uh, essentially, is over all these repostings, you've lost all the backstory to how these photographs came about. Yeah. Because there's, there's nobody, there to, nobody there to tell you the backstory. Yeah. And so, I, I see Sasha says, yes, Navy. Yeah, thanks, Sasha. Yeah, that's Jan Maccabee, uh, her husband, who... Uh, the, yeah, the yeah. Well, just to, just to add to that, uh, it wasn't her son playing in a nearby football field at the same time when a UFO landed on the field. So this will have been, you know, obviously American football. I think it was American football. Uh, no, I don't know. Uh, I don't. At the very, very, a very similar time period when she saw this uh, predator type uh, thing know. in the trees. Yeah, I think there's some. Ah. I'm open. I'm open. I'm right. right. Well, I'm just looking. Anybody, yeah. for our moderator, <laughs> our moderator, Sky. Uh, I mean, people may have heard me tell her story, uh, and uh, she'd be the best person to tell it. And I have a feeling you probably wouldn't want to do that, to Sky. You know, not. I, not. I don't know. Now, this is the lady that uh, saw what she's called the jellyfish girl. And driving from Filey, if people we'll, we'll go into more detail. I'll speak to you in the week about this if you want to talk about it or if you want me to talk about it again, because I may get details wrong tonight. Uh, but driving from Filey with a husband and children pulls up at the roundabout. There's two roundabouts <clears throat> to get into Filey. It's like a bit of an horseshoe. And she pulls into the one that's closest to Bridlington, pulls up and there's cars whizzing past. And a few cars down, there's a guy pointing at her or pointing at them intently. The, 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 and it's not as he's waiting to feed round because it's summer season and it's quite busy uh, in, in summer season. So cars don't just sort of fly up and down the road. And she can see him a few cars. Back, and he's actually pointing at her. He's ca caught her attention. And then as, as the car slowly feeds round and they're waiting to filter in, this strange being looks through the window you see you said this guy so I, 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 I'm, I'm just giving the story and translucent skin can all see veins moving about in its head and it's looking at her with these uh, uh, tell me if I'm wrong angelic eyes and bumps all over its head and then it the, the car filters round and it's looking at her and it's just it must have been a bizarre thing to see and then the driver does something 
totally out of character, totally wrong, and pulls round all the cars and whizzes off into the distance. Uh, Sky can tell that story a lot better than me, and I'm not saying suggesting she comes on and tells it, but uh, I may have got some details of that wrong. But it's a brilliant account. Uh, now then they're saying no sound no audio can't hear les again put the put the mic on les please yeah sorry about that uh, well you're not going to believe this guys but um we did i did two what is it three tests this week with updated software now anybody who knows who uses computers a lot right you you don't know whether to update your software uh, because it's uh, telling you to update and then you bite the bullet you do it and um, you kind of end up in a strange place like we have tonight with our double screen. But we'll move on a little bit. Uh, so just bear with us. Yeah, microphone's on, is it now? It is, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So KM Creative, um, uh, welcome to the stream, uh, KM Creative. The question for Paul is, after all these years you've been investigating, Paul, what experience have you had that really scared slash unnerved you the most? my own experiences childhood i don't think that that can be i don't think i can beat it i mean i, I dare say if i saw something like these guys have seen in the forests uh it's, it's, it might even be worse it might be on par but whatever i saw and had interaction with during childhood and you know i mean i, I suppose you'd call them typical alien looking things then yeah, that that were terrifying, and it were designed for fear. It were designed to frighten me, you know. And I know there's a lot of people out there that say that these things are all love and light, and it's not. I don't say this lightly, you know. I don't sit here as a, I'm 60 years old as a 60 year old man, talking about these things as though it's just uh, it's blasé and off the cuff. It's took years to be able to talk about this, it, years and years where I sort of entered at it when I first got married when I first met Mary you know and, the, the, and never really spoke about it till the girls started growing up and then a few of them had weird experiences that, that were similar and you know uh, yeah my own experiences it's it fit and whatever it was that were interacting it were designed to create fear in my opinion for so for all the people that said the, the only thing that these things are here for are the good you better ask them why they're putting holes in people's bodies and uh, like they did with me and making me scream my head off at night and no sound coming from my mouth and uh, you know i've got a different story to tell yeah thanks for that paul and uh, lemus 73 are the scouts lads the same lads that seen the werewolf uh, i presume you uh, after hearing the scouts lads in the film whether it's the same story that you'd probably been uh, yes we've been hinting to in the past few months yes it is yeah 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 that is correct yeah and uh right then let's have a look uh terry reynolds 13 have you looked into the rewilding the uk program uh, from the un's environmental program i haven't looked into it but as i imagine that this is where we're wanting to introduce wolf and even bear and lynx uh, i think that are they going to start with links? I'm not certain, Terry. You probably know a lot more about this than me. And I think I think they're starting with wolves, Paul. But yeah, I could are they? Wrong. Yeah, well, that's yeah. fair crack. You know, I, I don't know. But so no, I haven't looked into it, and uh, it may be a good thing. It may be a bad thing. I mean, look at what we touched on earlier. With if 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 there's true thing, the th two breeding pairs of cats in the forests of North Yorkshire, the the people who know that they're there think it's a good thing. 
you know, saplings and trees, what the, the deer would normally sort of nibble and they'd never get to grow, they, you know, they're, they're keeping that population down. Okay, Steve O seventy one. Uh, going back to the uh, the fifteen minute promo trailer, uh, will this be going up on the channel as an expanded trailer to promote the release? No. Uh, he's suggesting Steve O is suggesting it'd be great to pull it to pull in sales. It, it probably would, Steve O. You know, but uh, it won't be doing. Uh, and, and well, Les, I can't speak for Les. This is a joint venture, but in my own opinion, is no. Uh, you know, we've 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 put that that short fifteen minutes. Well, it is slightly short, under fifteen minutes together. It gives an overview of the account. Obviously, an hour and a half, you're going to see a lot more detail and get to know the stories and get to know the people involved. In most cases, you know, as regards what they've seen and experienced. I mean, there's Chris on screen with a cap on behind us. I mean, I said before, that guy's been instrumental. We, you know, we're, we're so grateful for Chris for taking part and the witnesses. I mean, they're key, you know, they're key. And and all the people that have helped in the reconstruction, the children, it's fabulous. You know, we've, we've loads to thank, loads of people to thank. So, you know, I, I, it just is what it is. <clears throat> Okay, so let's have a look then. Uh, ah, MKM Mike, <coughs> the MKM MD Exploration and Paranormal. Paul, are you able to elaborate on the seven bodies? Or, well, I'll just jump in yeah, there. Yeah, you, you know as much uh, about yeah. that as me. <laughs> yeah, I th I, uh, really, that would be, uh, you'd find out more about the bodies when the, the actual film comes out. That's all I can say on that one. You, you know, yeah. but we're, we're quite lucky that uh, a, a good friend of mine uh, exchanged correspondence and conversations with the late Tony Dodd. So that's how we've got come to get the recording and the corris correspondence. And it was Tony that was investigating the, the bodies that were found in, in the forests of North Yorkshire. Uh, primarily, we're not giving no secrets away, Dalby Forest. He found out about that. But what's interesting, where the guys are sat around the campfire and what they saw is only a few miles away. Where the gamekeeper was based is only four or five miles away. Am I, am I then saying that these creatures are responsible for the, the, the bodies? No, I'm not. Once again, we've got multi-phenomena uh, activity within the area. But it is interesting that Tony Dodd was researching and he was researching in, into strange creatures within the forest back in na the late 1990s when the gamekeeper were there and he were having his experience. Did the two meet? Never. Interesting, you know. I, I saw in the questions list, somebody said, Paul, I, I might have got this wrong because wrong, the question's gone up screen now. Uh, has anybody else in the area or is the evidence of anybody else in the area having similar experiences to yourself? I wouldn't know. The experiences I had in childhood, I didn't speak about. I didn't talk about to, to school friends. I didn't talk about to my mum and dad. But I, for one, I know what my dad had done to me. Uh, you know, because, uh, you know, regardless of the fact that I, I love my dad and he's now passed away, he, 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 he was a man that would hit first and ask questions later and he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have tolerated me talking about anything like that. I'd have been too frightened. So, yeah, it took years for me to speak about these things. So I should imagine if there are people in the area, and, and bearing in mind 100 miles away that that happened to me in South Yorkshire, not Bridlington, I'm sat in silence. I think there's people out there that have got stories far more interesting than mine that are just sat in silence. And uh, I, I, I'm not going to bring people in chat into this conversation because they might not want to, but I know that there's a lady in chat that's had a traumatic experience. And... Uh, you know, and and I can I can see people that that I've spoke to, just moving up and down in that chat that have had similar experiences. Not necessarily the same, but equally as interesting, or if interesting is the word, as my own. Okay, I'll um, I'll just go to uh, just jump forward a little bit to Johnny Appleseed. I've got to get this one in uh, because we are very proud of the uh, the film that we've made, uh, uh, Paul and I. And uh, obviously, we're three years' work going into it. So, Johnny Appleseed is saying, 
You should both be very proud with this. Looking amazing. Can't wait to get my hands on it. Great stuff. Well, thank, thank you. you very much, uh, Johnny. Yeah, that's 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 really kind of you to say. I mean, uh, and I, I'm looking at another question, Les. Uh, Rob uh, Tricklis, I, th I think that's how we're pronouncing it. Have you ever considered doing a live investigation out in the field, so to speak? Well, uh, if you watch the film, you'll see that's all we have done. That's what separates it. We are not just doing talking heads, sat in a cafe and then going back to a reconstruction. When when I say that I'm going onto the cliffs and into the forests, I'm in there. I'm sleeping in there. That's it. That's all part of it. There's too many researchers just want to sit at a keyboard, gathering information, looking at new really, newly, newly released documents and spitting it out as though it's some fabulous thing that they're talking about, bearing in mind that most podcasts in the world are going to be talking about the same thing. Is that research? Reashing other people's work. This is this is new. And uh, for Patricia Adams Wright, and well, she's asking Patricia uh, Willis be going to DVD. As we said earlier, Patricia, uh, we're looking at pitching the film at the end of February, so it's only at that period that you get to know more about its availability. So, and uh, there's a couple couple more people asking. Very similar thing, so hoping that clears that one up. I see. Uh, Go on, then. I, I just saw, why is East Yorkshire? Why is, I don't really said East Yorkshire or Yorkshire such a hotspot. And uh, I, I can't answer that. It's, it, it, it's, we aren't sounding sarcastic. You'd be like saying, why is black black? I've, I've no idea. Or white white. Do you know what I'm saying? It's just, it's a question that's that, <laughs> geographically. I, I, I don't know whether there's anything within the makeup of the land. I don't know. Or... It's, it's unanswerable to me, anyway. Um, Simon Womack is asking, Paul, any more strangeness on Jackson Bay? There's a lot of strangeness on Jackson Bay. That Now, what, interestingly, <clears throat> it, yeah, yeah, it, well, we're just, we're just moving up from out on the outskirts of Scarborough. And if you look at the guy... In the, in the film, not the one that we're looking at now behind Les, but the one earlier on in the film that said the animal and the energy in the earth as it was coming towards him, he sat on top of Scalby Mills overlooking Jackson's Bay. And at the other side of him would be Scarborough. You know, uh, <clears throat> if you if you travelled if you travelled to the right, to the left, you've got Jackson's Bay. I've got, and I've got reports from rock anglers who've been night fishing in Jackson's Bay and they've seen UFOs multiple multi-witness sightings of ufos in jackson's bay they've gone on film about it as well and not in wolflands you know and we've got record I'll, I'll ask them if i can record them telling me don't make it gospel but it always adds to, to more meat to the bone the one one particular angler i'm going to say rock angler they're actually beach anglers because they've gone down into the bay and they're fishing from the shore fishing there in the night once again this uneasy feeling comes over him which which seems to run the gauntlet of all the genres of unexplained phenomena. And he feels very uneasy, feels quite nervous. And he gets a flashlight and shines it up to the, the cliffs. Now, you can climb down these cliffs in most places. They're not like Bempton and Speeton. You know, they're just rough earth cliffs with boulders and rocks at the bottom. And he says there's an animal walking along the bottom of the cliff that's huge. Like he said, big as a Great Dane, but it looked like a cat or a cross between a dog and a cat. What is words? Middle of the night, we're in middle of nowhere as well, people. They said it just carried on going. He says there's a path that he'd come down, well-worn path, and this thing went up the path. Could it have been somebody's dog that's just been let out on its own? An Irish wolfhound, something like that. There's always that possibility. You know, I'm not going to discount these things and look at it as sarcasm if somebody suggested that in chat, because I just don't know. But just a strange quirky story that this guy came up with but then we've got a snowstorm in the bay where there's two rock anglers I keep saying rock anglers people don't know but this is on the beach two anglers beach fishermen but i'm saying it because the same guys also fish the cliff tops and uh, they're a good distance apart one of them's waving in the night because nobody can hear him they're in a snowstorm and he's pointing he says and this thing all lit up between the swathes of snow, and you can see it's spinning. 
There's all lights around it and what he said were revolving panels. And obviously it caught his attention. They're looking at it and it's not high up. I wrote about it in Truth Proof too. And then just zipped away. This thing just zipped away into the night. So Jackson's Bay is a, is an, another interesting place. And when you consider that the, the witness from in Wolfland who had his strange experience on the top of the cliffs overlooking Jackson's Bay. So probably, what, 300 foot away from the actual bottom of the bay. We're in the same proximity. So everything's linked. And then we're on a stone's throw away from the Forge Valley, from Hackness and East Ayton. And I saw somebody in the chat mention, uh, type the name in the Bargest, which is quite apt, really. And we've mentioned the Bargest in, in Wolfland because 120 years before I ever wrote anything or did any research into Wolfland, a writer called Howard Brealey was documenting a huge, fearsome, bipedal, fur-covered hound with glowing eyes that haunted the moors and forests of North Yorkshire, East Ayton, literally a mile, two miles away from the locations where some of these people have had their experiences. So are we looking at the same things? I think there's a strong possibility that we are. Okay, when we're, we're uh, well, okay, almost nine yeah. o'clock. Yeah, we're yeah, and uh, I'm I'm really really uh, trying to get through some of these questions now with only <coughs> a couple of minutes to go. It's going to be difficult. Um, Lee Roscoe's just uh, asking, has Paul has Paul noticed most of the witnesses of the sightings are on their own? Well, it's well kind of well, not strictly well, true, is it, really? No. Uh, in, in, in what we reported on well, the film. Well, the lady at Flamborough, she was with a guy, Lee. Lee's not gone on film because he didn't want to, but Lee didn't come back up to go on film. I should, I should imagine work pre prevented that. The, the guys in Broxer, there was three of them. Two have gone on film. The gamekeeper was alone. But the gamekeeper that was with him in 2002, he heard the strange noises in the forest. He... He, he, he experienced quite a bit of the activity as well. Uh, Fred Flintstone is asking who's narrating. Well, I think you should... Uh, well, I'm narrating it, to be honest with you, yeah. Uh, but myself and Les have done everything, uh, literally everything, barring the, the music, which Mick Park's responsible for, Jessica Pym, my daughter, her husband, Nick Pym, and Nick Britton are doing the music. Mary, my wife, has made the costume, uh, and we've 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 done loads. We, I wish we'd more time, people, because it would be quite funny if we played you some of the clips of the, trying this costume out. Because we've been out with it probably five or six times with Chris Wright. Chris has wore the costume for us and, and trying to replicate this, and it's just it just weren't happening. It really took a lot of doing, and. Thank God Mary had patience to keep adapting it and adjusting it and doing what we kept asking her to do. So, yeah, once again, we're, we're very fortunate that we've had loads of help. Although me and Les principally have done the work, we've had lots of help along the way. One final question I'll get in from Tina. And, uh, Paul, are the bodies associated with the Tony Dodd that was looking into the human mutilations? Yes. Yes, they are. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's the last question I can get in tonight. Oh, I'm sorry, folks. Because we're just playing it at the back because yeah. you asked the question, Tino. Yeah, and um, yeah, I apologise for not getting through all the questions tonight. I know we covered most of uh, the questions that came in into the chat, and uh, yeah, I've got to thank uh, Sky for doing the moderating tonight. Uh, obviously, yeah, we was really, really thanked up uh, and really wanted to get this 15 minutes easier out to you guys. And we really appreciate all the feedback that you've uh, given us uh, from what you've seen. <coughs> and I'll leave the last word with Paul. No, the, we're out. I, I think we've done it. I mean, uh, quickly then, save me typing it. I can see Nigel Logan, Patrick Daniel, Sasha Christie, Alison Woods, Aldo Rain, Lee Roscoe, Steve, Lemurs, Nigel, everybody, Nick's Exploration as they're coming up, JVPA. Thank you. Thanks. Just thanks for sticking with it. You know, because we've banged on about Wolflands for, for years. And we finally, we, we get in there and uh, we're, we're quite pleased with it. So I hope you guys enjoy it when it's done. Thank you.
Okay, so good night. It's good night from me. I'm Patricia Wright Adams, my Pat, Shirley, Newsy Brown, Aldo Rain, all good. Fred Flintstone. I could go on forever. That's why I'm not going to type it, people. Good night. Right, we're out of here. Good night. Disabled Welshman. Ha, ha, ha.